This afternoon, I have the pleasure of introducing Mark Zuckerberg, which is one of our guest speakers this uh, semester, to come and talk a little bit about computer science in the real world. As most of you probably know, as you guys are all do this much more than I do, founder of Facebook.com, which is a social networking program, whatever you want to call it, used it over 2,000 schools uh, across the nation and possibly the world. Is it the world too or just the nation? Okay. So uh, good influence for you know, doing some things in computer science. He's going to tell us some of the background of it and, and what's been important and so forth. So please join me in welcoming. Yo. All right, cool. This is the first time I ever have had to hold one of these things. So I'm just going to attach it really quickly. good? Is this amplified at all? Yeah. All right, sweet. So, um, you know, this is like one of the first times I've been to a lecture at Harvard. Um, but, um, <laughs> but, you know, I, so I guess like what's probably going to be most useful for you guys if I just take you through some of the courses that I took at Harvard where I actually did go to lecture sometimes. I was joking. And, um, and sort of like how different decisions that I had to make when I was moving along with Facebook got impacted by different stuff that I was learning in the classes that I was taking. And you know, if all goes according to plan, then maybe some of you guys will come out of this thinking that taking CS or engineering stuff at Harvard is actually sort of useful. So that's the game plan. Um, I think that this is slotted for two hours. There's no way I'm going to speak for two hours. I'll probably speak for like 20 minutes or 15 minutes, and then I'll just let you guys ask questions, because I'm sure you guys have more interesting stuff to ask me than I can come up with to talk about myself. So um, OK. So I guess I'll just kind of get started. Um, when I was here, I started off taking 121. I never actually took 50. So I'm probably, you know, you should have gotten the, the other guy who was doing Facebook, Dustin Moskowitz, who is my roommate. When we got started, um, the site was written in PHP, which isn't something that you learn in one of these classes. But fortunately, if you have a good background in C, the syntax is very similar. And you can pick it up in like, you know, like a day or two. So um, we started. I started writing the site and um, launched it at Harvard in February 2004, so I guess almost two years ago now. And within a couple of weeks, a few thousand people had signed up. And we started getting some emails from people at other colleges asking for us to launch it at their schools. And I was taking 161 at the time, so I don't know if you guys know like the reputation of that course. But it, I mean, it was kind of heavy. Um, it was a really fun course, but it didn't leave me with much time to do anything else with Facebook. So my roommate, Dustin who I guess had just finished CS50, was like, hey, I, I want to help out. I want to do the expansion and like and help you figure out how to do the stuff. So I was like, you know, that's pretty cool, dude. But you don't really know any PHP or anything like that. So that weekend, he went home, bought the book Perl for Dummies, came back and was like, all right, I'm ready to go. I was like, dude, the site's written in PHP, not Perl. But you know, that's cool. So he picked up PHP um, over you know, like a few days. Because I promise that if you have a good background in C, like PHP is a very simple thing to pick up. And, um, and he just kind of went to work. So I mean, the first big decision that we really had to make was in how to kind of expand the architecture to go from the single school type setup that we had when it was just at Harvard to something that supported multiple schools. So I mean, this was a decision that kind of had to be made on a bunch of levels, both like in the product and how we wanted privacy to work. But I think that one really important decision that's helped us scale pretty well is how we decided to distribute the data. So I, mean, I don't know how much of like kind of um, complexity stuff and like big O notation you guys do in this class. Uh, okay. So I mean, one of the most complicated computations that we do on the site is the computation to tell how you're connected to people, right? Because I mean, if you can imagine that's stored as sort of a series of, um, of I guess, undirected. It's not weighted. Um, so undirected, unweighted pairs of ID numbers of people in the database. Then if you want to figure out who's friends with someone, you have to look at all their friends. Right? So that's maybe like 100 or 200 people. But then if you want to figure out like who's a friend of a friend or what the closest connection is there, then you kind of have to look at the 100 or 200 friends of each of those friends. So it becomes, in, like at each level, a, there's another factor of n multiplied in, the, where n is the number of friends that 
the person that all each of your friends has. So you can see that this kind of becomes exponentially difficult to to solve for the shortest path between people. So I mean, if you're just looking for a friend of a friend that's n squared, if you're looking for a friend of a friend of a friend that's n cubed, and I mean that's something that traditionally was pretty difficult for a lot of the predecessor sites to Facebook. So, and for example, Friendster had large problems with this because they were trying to compute paths six degrees out or like seven degrees out. And I mean that's something that when you're doing like n seventh, like that just is really, I guess, very hard. And you know, took down their site for a while. So I mean, one of the things that we took that we kind of had in mind when we were figuring out how to do this was how do you distribute the database in such a way that this computation becomes manageable. So what we decided was that everyone um, on the site does most of their activity at the school that they're kind of based at. So I mean, if you're at Harvard, then you know, like most of the people who you're going to be seeing or transacting with on the site are going to be at Harvard. It's actually probably like 90% of the stuff that you do on the site. So we decided to split up the databases and create one um, instance of a MySQL database for each school on the network. And um, in doing that, we, I mean, if you notice, the, the paths that we compute are only within the school. So instead of, say, like now we're at 6 million users, and um, you know, instead of having to do n cubed over some portion of 6 million, it's just n cubed over 10,000, which is a much more manageable, I guess, type of computation. So that was sort of the first like, big architectural decision that we had to make that contributed to us not dying a few months later. Um, and I don't know, it was probably like a pretty important one. So I mean, is, when we first started, set up the site, we had um, just one computer that we were running. It wasn't in our dorm room. We were renting it. I kind of learned my lesson for trying to run a computer, uh, like run a site out of my dorm room a few months earlier. And Harvard almost tried to kick me out. So, um, like, so I ended up renting a server off site this time, and um, and I guess like running originally the database and the web server. So Apache is what we were using in this instance to uh, to serve the pages from the same machine, and because we distributed the databases in the way that we did, we were able to as time went on just add more machines linearly and sort of just grow the site without having any kind of exponential expansion on the amount of machinery that we had. But after we hit, say, about like 30 or 50 schools, we started running into, we started realizing that we could start getting more performance out of MySQL or Apache. Um, and that like some of the way that stuff was set up just like wasn't as optimal as it could be. So I mean, for example, when you have MySQL machines and Apache machines on the same, or like MySQL and Apache running on the same server, then if something happens to that server, then not only does the database for that school or the schools on that server just stop kind of responding in a way that is like, that will get you anything useful, but you can't even load any web pages. So you get page not founds. And that kind of sucks. But um, another issue is that the variance and the use from school to school is also not going to be perfect. So I mean, some schools are always going to be kind of have heavier use. I mean, we have schools now like Penn State that have 50,000 users. And then the majority of the schools, I think, still have less than 2,000 users, you know, just because there's a lot of small schools and a lot of schools that don't have complete ubiquity. So, um, so I mean, in trying to deal with this issue and like kind of make it so that you could deal with the fact that, you know, Penn State had 50,000 people and just a ton of users all the time, and then you have some schools that don't. What we decided to do is separate out some of the web servers from the database servers and make it so that you could, um, so that we just had a pool of Apache web servers that we could um, load balance between and make it so that you can use those uniformly while just having the database layer be sort of consistent. So um, I don't know if this stuff is interesting to you guys at all, uh, or like, or I mean, if this is anything that like that matters to you know what you guys are studying now. I mean, so if there's more stuff that like you guys would rather know about in terms of the architecture, then I'll kind of like leave that open to questions later. So I'm um, just that I don't spend a lot of time like just talking about like random applications that you guys might not ever care to use. But like, um, let me try to find some interesting examples. So I mean, so I guess like 
one of the things that was pretty interesting was just sort of trying to, like, when we got to a point in terms of traffic where we started maxing out the performance of some of these open source applications that are generally pretty performant. So, for example, um, MySQL is a really good open source database. All right, and I don't know if any of you guys sort of in your own time mess around and like make anything with MySQL or have used it in any way. But like, I mean, it's pretty easy to use, and it's also like decently quick. You know, indices work pretty well. It's not as fully featured as something like Oracle, but it's pretty good. And I mean, we got to a point where I think around when we started doing like maybe a hundred million page views a day, that um, that we started running into some bottlenecks on that. So like, um, so for example, a typical query on MySQL might take like two to four milliseconds, and I mean, that's not that much, but like, when you're doing 100 billion of page views a day, and each page view might have like 30 to 50 queries, I mean, especially if you're doing something like a profile view that just kind of queries all kinds of different information, then that kind of starts to suck. So we started to develop a caching sort of layer that, that kind of allowed quicker access to some of the information. And originally, we were using another open source application, Memcache, which I don't know if and you guys have any experience with that. But like, it was pretty quick. It got access times down to like, I guess like 0.3 to 0.5 milliseconds, which is pretty good. But it also like has a bunch of sort of distribution issues. Um, and I mean, it's supposed to be like a distributed hash table sort of application where it's like, you can just attach like any number of memcache boxes in a cluster and be able to just like hook it up and have it go. But we sort of ran into a lot of issues there where like different memcache boxes would go down and there was no redundancy on the information. So like when a memcache box went down and you had a cache miss, then all of a sudden like you had a lot more traffic going to a, like a specific set of databases and that would suck. So, um, so as time went on, we even kind of like outgrew memcache and sort of the indices on MySQL. And I mean, we still use that stuff, but we had to build on top of that extra redundancy. And I mean, I think that like, that's something that's probably like maybe a little interesting, but I mean, I'll let you guys ask me more questions about that later. I'm like not really sure what would be interesting to talk about right now. Um, maybe you guys could help out a little. <laughs> Go for it. Yeah, so I mean, I think that like, so that's not a technical question at all, but um, like, I don't know. I mean, so I guess I'll just like go into question time now because like I'm not really sure what's like relevant stuff for me to be discussing. So I'll just answer this and then anyone else who wants to ask me questions can just go for that. Um, I mean, I guess like I never really spent a lot of time worrying about stuff like, I mean, there are companies out there like Google that could just sort of get into your space and do whatever you want at any time. And I mean, I think that like one of the cool things about, about like this time in technology is that individuals are leveraged and able to do way more than they'd really ever been able to do before. You know, and like even like four years ago when Google was started, I mean, now they have hundreds of thousands of machines, you know, and probably billions of dollars spent on equipment. I think like the generation before Google, you couldn't even make a site without sort of like some big piece of hardware. And I think uh, like eBay, for example, ran off of two like fifty thousand dollar machines or something. And like it's like you just can't start doing that if you're just a kid in a dorm room, you know. So I think that like the fact that we could sort of rent machines for you know like a hundred dollars a month and use that to scale up to a point where we had three hundred thousand users is is pretty cool and it's a pretty unique thing that like that's going on in technology right now and I mean it it like makes it so that instead of worrying about just like who's sort of the big player and like 
what is Google going to do next? You can do more of like, um, you could just like get a lot of stuff done. And, and I mean, instead of like having to go out and have some of the traditional business problems, like you have to raise capital before you can make anything, like that's no longer an issue. So you can just like, you're leveraged to do a lot more on your own now. I don't, I don't know if that kind of answers the question that you're asking, but I mean, I mean, it's sort of, it's one of the reasons why I think that at this point it makes a lot of sense to be studying this stuff. Because like, it, like at no point in the past could you leverage like such a small amount of money to get powerful enough technology to really touch people in the way that you can today. So I mean, Google does about 250 million page views a day, right? They have hundreds of thousands of machines and like 5,000 employees. Um, Facebook does 400 million page views a day. So that's like almost, you know, I mean, that's like a lot more than Google does, you know? And we have hundreds of machines and we just passed 50 employees. So like, and that's just like a, a sort of a technical generation of three or four years in the architectures that were created. So I mean, and then you go like three or four years back before that to from like eBay to Google and it's just completely different because I mean at least Google was running off of this like a lot of distributed equipment that I mean they have hundreds of thousands of machines but the idea there was get a lot of shitty machines you know that are like really cheap and I mean that's a big step up because then it's like okay that's more redundant you know I mean you, they're not losing information they don't expect stuff to always work it's a much more kind of mature attitude than um than eBay's which I mean was the only thing that they could do at the time but yeah The what? The, the recap yeah, well, which one? Um, I was just wondering if you've, like, I mean, have you released it all? If you're sending some insights? Because one thing I noticed is that, yeah, there are really good available libraries for you to do stuff that was always one mm -hmm. of the most resources. So have you looked at implementations of that to build all the redundancy that you need? Or have you just been working yeah. on Yeah. Um, a lot of the stuff that we didn't necessarily <laughs> extend memcache, but we, like, built a bunch <laughs> of stuff like ourself. So I mean right now it's not it's not open source. I mean I like we consider doing it and I mean there's a lot of work that goes into making stuff open source which I mean it's like on top of whether or not you want to like lose the competitive advantage it's just like it's kind of unfortunate because I mean I think that if it were just easier to make something that like that then then you could do it. Like you could just like release the code but like then there's a lot of support, you know, and like and like licensing and all that stuff and I don't know. We found that it's been kind of annoying. I mean, one of the things that we actually considered making open source was this search server that actually that guy sitting right there made um, <laughs> while he was still out in California. Um, and I guess like we got to a point where MySQL was lagging a little on some of the searches that we were trying to do. And um, we decided that it would be a cool thing to do to just like make sort of a series of like distributed machines that could kind of, uh, he doesn't use a hash table. What's the structure that you use, McCollum? <laughs> so I mean, yeah, we, we thought about making that open, but, uh, but then like that's when we kind of like had to do all this work to like come up with a license and we're just like, all right, you know, screw that. <laughs> but. <laughs> Hiring people, um, I guess. Like when, as you grow, like the most important thing is to have smart people, right? I mean, like, I and mean, if you think about how, uh, like, the technical leverage stuff that I was just talking about and answering that guy's question, um, like, as technology becomes sort of more generic and less expensive, the leverage point becomes more in the people. You know, so I mean. So if, and if you kind of think about this from a perspective of like a person to people time spent or like user time spent or page view analysis, it's like because of technology now, like people are much more leveraged to kind of do um, uh, and to do more things and just be more important in the equation, you know? So it, because of that, it's like really important to get the most, to get the most intelligent people. And also, I mean, it's like when you're a small company, then you can be really nimble and get a lot of stuff done, and there's relatively little bureaucracy. So if you have smart people who can take advantage of that to build cool things, then that's awesome. 
Yeah. Um, I mean, I guess besides that, <laughs> um, I don't know, designing new things. There's not much corporate bureaucracy yet, so I don't have to waste that much time on that. <coughs> Keep on going. <laughs> Um, I have a lawyer who works for me full time. Okay. Yeah. Is there like a big part of, um, of running a business? Like, did you guys have uh, work from home during that period early on? Um, we didn't. And that, I guess, provided some annoyance later on. Um, I guess, like, getting stuff set up really well. Is good, right? I mean, it's like it, getting stuff clean is really good, and I mean, no one's ever going to tell you like, oh, like a lawyer's bad. It's all just a, like a question of opportunity cost and what you prioritize, right? And like, I guess that in our case, it it's like we now have to deal with like a bunch of stuff that wasn't set up properly in the beginning, but like, I mean, actually, most of that stuff is dealt with, so I mean, it's not even a big deal anymore. But like, but instead of talking to lawyers early on, we were making stuff. You know, and like I think that that was probably the right use of our time. So it's like I mean I think that one cool characteristic of a lot of the companies that end up being really successful, not that we are really successful, but I guess we also fall into this bucket, is that they started off as someone trying to make something cool and not someone trying to make a company. You know, and like I mean you kind of have, like, Google came out of um, Larry and Sergey's, like, PhD dissertation at Stanford. And Yahoo came out of just, like, I guess, also some Stanford guys just, like, kind of screwing around in their dorm room. And eBay came out of, like, some guy trying to build a marketplace for his girlfriend to exchange Pez dispensers. You know, I, Amazon was a little more calculated. Um, but, like, but, I mean, so I, I can't imagine that any of those people really had that much advice, and it seems to have worked out okay for them. But I mean, at the same time, I'm not going to kind of sit here and tell you not to get advice on stuff. I mean, a lot of times people are just like too careful, too. I mean, it's like I think it's more useful to like make things happen and then like apologize later than it is to make sure that you dot all your eyes now and then like just not get stuff done. Yeah. Go for it. Well, I mean, I think that I think that you're kind of always at that point, right? Um, I mean, most companies are started on like a couple of ideas, and those are like a few things that they do well, right? So, so I mean, Yahoo's was like, we're going to organize all this information in the world like by directory, right? And that was like what they started off doing, and then they kind of diversified out as time went on and built more stuff. And like, a lot of that stuff is like the core of their business now. I mean, it's like they didn't originally do search, you know. And now directory just like doesn't exist. You know, it just it sucks. You know, there's like no utility for it. Um, I mean, Google's big thing was just like they did PageRank, you know, and then I guess like out out of PageRank, they have search, and now they kind of extend that to do other similar type of algorithms, searching in other spaces. But I mean. You can kind of tell how like all the other stuff that they're doing is sort of tangential, and it's like they're trying really hard to like made, make PageRank and other types of algorithms that are very similar to that like work in their spaces, and it's it's just like not as elegant or pure of an idea as the original one was. Um, so I mean, Facebook, for example, when it just got started, like what I thought was the most interesting thing was just to be able to type in someone's name and find out information about them. I mean, there was like hardly any of the stuff that was there now. There's no groups. Um, there was no messages, even. There was poking. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, so I mean, so it's like you kind of get started on like some kind of core idea. And that's like, and generally, like the company will do well because I guess like the people who are starting off working on that core idea kind of understand that single core idea in some sort of unique way, but that doesn't imply that they have any 
better understanding of anything else than anyone else. Yeah. So that's why kind of surrounding yourself with a lot of smart people is really important. Um, I mean, there's a lot of applications on the internet now that do that stuff, right? So I mean, Flickr is a pretty cool photo application. Although I think like in three weeks we passed them in the number of photos that we had on our site. But like, um, I mean, I think that the coolest thing about photos is that you can tag them and like in the way that makes them link to people's profiles and. I think that that's something that you can really only do if you have the context of like everyone around you on the site. You know, it's a, like that kind of requires a ubiquity of usage. Um, so I don't know if any of the other guys would have done that if they had that kind of use, but they didn't. Yeah. I don't know. Don't any of you guys have any CS questions? <laughs> Um, what's an idea? Oh, yeah, what's an example? So I work with them on my stuff and so you know, just with you know, the next thing you want to do is pictures and work with people together. How do you go about figuring out mm -hmm. which technology is a good one? How do you mine to find technology? Which do you have mm -hmm. any processes in place today that are that are directly focused on this thing or technology that's come into the company to just be around this thing? And somebody mentioned something you might want to do. So like I think that m our process for filtering what technologies to use are like trust the smart people, right? <laughs> so it's like so we definitely have some people at the company who are just like really smart, you know, and like and I think that most of the people at the company are generally pretty smart, but like I mean th there are a few guys in particular I'm not one of them um, who just like who I think that when they say that like something is generally like a good practice to go at it, then it's relatively like then they can get support for that pretty easily. And like and I think that a lot of the engineers sort of like build a consensus around that. Um, I'm trying to think of like a good example. I, I think that like it's somewhat goal oriented. So like with so with photos we, we knew that we wanted to support just people uploading unlimited photos. So I mean, there's no real concept of like unlimited. It's just like you have to keep on adding stuff, right? It, like keep on adding storage, and you want to make it so that um, it kind of works as seamlessly as possible. So the first thing that we were trying to do was like, well, let's evaluate like um, these companies that just do sort of large storage for a living, right? So like NetApp or something, network appliance. So we talked to them for a while, and then we're like, all right, well, we don't really want to go with like this like single big box approach. We want to go with like having um, just a, a series of distributed smaller boxes with a lot of hard drive and a lot of RAM. And so I think that the architecture that we first built was one where we had a bunch of those machines with relatively slow but very stable disk behind a level uh, a layer of caching boxes with like a ton of RAM that could hold most of the thumbnails and the most frequently accessed images in like I guess in, in like in RAM at any time. And then like right before we launched, it occurred to us that we were gonna have like some issues with this. And um and the issues that we were gonna have were gonna be network issues, not not like hard hardware issues. So like for example, if you take a photo album of thirty photos and each of your photos is three megabytes then you have to upload 90 megabytes to Facebook. And that kind of sucks, right? I mean, it sucks but, like, because people tend to have like, not optimal connections and because um, like, our router, like, I guess most routers are set up to only be able to handle a gigabit at a time. So and routers are kind of expensive. They're like, they are big pieces of equipment. I don't think that there is a distributed version of that yet. But like, um, so we couldn't in the time frame that we wanted to launch it just like get a new router and get it set up. So like, so what we ended up doing was building a Java applet and an ActiveX control that like <coughs> coupled the choosing of the photos that people wanted to upload with compression on the client side to make it smaller. 
And then like that way, people can just like upload their photos relatively quickly. And then they're like, we also save CPU on our side because we don't have to like do the compression on our side, although that wasn't that huge of a bottleneck. Um, so that worked. And then we got it to a point where we were up having uploads at a rate of like 100 a second. And like people were using the feature like way more than we thought we were going to. And even though we had this like caching tier set up, it just like still wasn't fast enough. And I'm sure you guys remember this. Like a few weeks ago, the site was not having a good time. Um, and like, so what we ended up doing at that point was kind of using edge caching, so like type, like Akamai type of stuff, to like make these photos, which are static content, just be closer to people. So that way, we can sort of offload some of the um, the equipment and the, the sort of like having to transfer these still like somewhat large files to people. So that's where we are now, and it seems to be working pretty well. It's not like, it wasn't that we had any sort of upfront technical genius about it. It was just sort of that like at each point we sort of anticipated the issues or picked them out pretty quickly and then had enough competence to evaluate, I think, what the options were that we had and make what I think were decent decisions about how to execute on them. What's that? Take that to the next level, too, in terms of the problems you just talked about. Yeah. What's up? Curly braces for the you know, program and things. So huh. How was the, the structure for software engineering actually done with this kind of thing? Um, so the way that I guess like the methodology that we have is that um, I want it to be like as sort of like as much of a meritocracy as possible, where the people who can come up with the coolest solutions and implement them the quickest and have like the fewest bugs sort of get to work on like the stuff that they think is the most interesting and go off and like have the most influence in the company. So we're also onboarding a lot of people because we're hiring relatively quickly. And in doing so, we sort of have, we pair up like new people who are coming in with some of like the better people who like who are sort of at like the top of the chain. And then um, we have them sort of like work with those people when they first come in to learn the stuff that they're working on uh, so, so that the new guys, like the incoming class, can sort of like learn what like some of the people who are currently at the company are working on. And I think in doing that, they pick up the style and sort of the methods that we use for doing stuff. But I think that like, I don't know. I mean, it, it changes pretty quickly. I think one difference between sort of the way stuff works in a company and the way stuff works in school is that this is a very iterative process. Right? And like, I mean, it's nice when you get stuff right the first time, but like we don't need to. And I think that a lot of companies go through phases where they just like or stages where they don't get stuff right the first time. Like Microsoft, I mean, I don't know when the last time was that they had a good product before version four. You know, but like by the time they get to version four, it's like always good. You know, for the most part. So, um, and I think that like works out pretty well for them. And I mean, Google always like releases their stuff in beta. So, we sort of like, I guess. We try to have multiple people work on the same thing so everyone can learn from each other and like to kind of pick off some of the mistakes that might be made that we can, I guess, like reduce pretty quickly. But like, I guess in general, the idea is that it doesn't have to be perfect the first time around. And as long as you get the architecture as right as possible, then a lot of the other implementation stuff isn't going to be as big of a deal. And you can sort of work that out at any time. I don't know if that's sort of asking, answering the question that you asked. But. Um, the internet's a pretty good tool. Yeah. Um, I think that like that that's how we did most of it. I mean, we usually, I mean, we kind of make a point of not hiring people for skills because 
I guess the theory is like if someone has skills in an area and has been doing it for 10 or 15 years, then that's probably what they can do. You know, and like that's good and that means that they can do that. But if you hire someone so say like right out of college, you know, or someone younger who you're just hiring them for raw intelligence, then the idea is that they're going to be able to learn stuff re really quickly. I and mean, there's a lot of information available just like all over the place. And I mean, now within recent years, there's like good tools for sorting through that. And like, um, I think that the most performant people we have are like sort of younger people who didn't necessarily know that much about anything specific coming out of college. I mean, a good example is like, I mean, Dustin, my roommate at Harvard, wasn't even a CS major. He was an economics major. You know, and he's just like a really smart dude. And was able to pick it up. Um, some of the other good people we have are EE majors out of Stanford, you know, or Berkeley. And I mean, it's not, they aren't even CS all the time. Like math people, it's like if you studied math, you can learn this stuff relatively quickly you know, a lot of the time. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, I never really hire people just because they have business skills. Like I think that like, and it's actually kind of funny, but knowledge of a lot of core CS stuff is really important in business too. So I mean, one of the main things that you learn when you're studying CS is like complexity and scale, and like that is like a huge issue in business too. It's like how do you go from having five people to a hundred people, and like what's like kind of the change in the dynamic there. Um, and like, how are certain processes? Like, how is a sales force going to scale from like five people to a hundred people? You know, and I mean, it's like the same type of intelligence that figure that can figure out both of those problems. And it's like it might be a different type of person who cares to solve the problems. But like, um, I think that like the the second part of my answer to what you said is that I think we're sort of continually in the process of building out infrastructure, and I don't think you ever get out of that process. And like, we're kind of Focusing not on just building something and figuring out how to make money off of it and sort of like maximizing the value of our business in the short term, but instead sort of like always looking to maximize what the long term value would be. And I think that in doing that, you kind of need to always just be building out your base and not at any time be worried about maximizing your money. Um, our peaks are pretty strong. So like at five in the morning, there's like, no matter how many users we have signed up, there's always like 5,000 people in, and that's it. And then like, if you get to like 9 p.m. Pacific, so like midnight here, which I guess is like the peak across the country, it's like close to 400,000 people using it simultaneously. And like, um, it's actually kind of interesting because I mean, we like monitor these graphs and we have this huge LCD in our office and like whenever there's a blip in the traffic we're like oh crap what happened and a lot of times it's like Laguna Beach, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so, um, but usually it doesn't swing that far the other way. Um, right now we don't, but. We may at some point in the future. Yeah, I'd like to follow up on that. So mm -hmm. What kind of issues do you talk about at the company in terms of privacy and security, all those sorts of things? Are you worried about it at all? Or do you put your, yeah. your, your privacy and security statement on, online here? Mm -hmm. So you just put it up and then not worry about it anymore? Well, I mean, I think that and what makes Facebook fun and useful is that there's a lot of information about a lot of people that you can get. But what's more important is that the information is available to the people who that person wants that information to be available to. And the flip side of that is that the information is available to the people who want to have access to that information. So I mean, one of the kind of the core decisions that we made was only to let people at the same school see each other's profiles. And I mean, I guess the idea behind that was that you're at Harvard, like you probably wouldn't have that 
hard of a time just like letting someone else at Harvard see your information. But it, at the same time, it's like only people who, at Harvard who you're probably going to see on a day-to-day -day basis and maybe meet who are ever going to want to look you up. You know, it's like it's not like some kid out at Stanford who you will never talk to is going to be interested in knowing what your cell phone number is. You know, or like what you're interested in. So by limiting the scope of the information to like sort of as narrow as makes sense, I think that we solve a lot of those issues. And then I mean, we also give people complete control over like how like what parts of their profile get shown. So we don't force anyone to show anything and we like I guess um, give people granular control over some of the more sensitive stuff. So like right next to the cell phone field, there's like another field that's like who do you want to show this to? Just your friends, you know, just people at your school, what? So I mean like we care about it because if people stop if people feel like their information isn't private, then that screws us in the long term too. So, yeah. Uh, just um, further on that, you, uh, I guess when, even though you put the information up yourself, what's the recourse in case, like, say you, you have a photo, somebody puts that photo up on some message board or some hot or not uh -huh. type site, like, how do you control what users do with the information that's been put onto your service? Um, it's very hard to control what people do with information that they have access to. I, I mean, there's like the best that we can do is give people control over their information and who can see it. And then once they let someone see it, it's sort of like out of anyone's control. Yeah. So I mean, I originally threw that together in like a half an hour. And um, I guess like it was pretty complicated because, or it was more complicated than I thought it was going to be. And I think like part of the reason why we changed it was because it didn't work as well as we wanted it to. And the original goal was to sort of make it so that you can have this wiki type thing on people's profiles that when you moused over something, it showed who kind of added that part of it, but like, I guess there were a lot of cases that that we missed, or it just like wasn't well designed by me. And like, I mean, I I don't know if you guys remember, but like you used to like mouse over stuff, and it just like wasn't as good. It, and like it might like tell you the wrong person, or it might highlight like more than it was supposed to. So I mean, so I kind of like coupled that with thinking like, you know, this isn't even the best feature. You know, it's like it would be much more interesting if instead of having to mouse over stuff, people could just like see the picture and the name of the person who posted everything without having to like just go through the whole wall. So over the summer, we just kind of went through and wrote a better parser for the walls and tried to decompose them. And then going forward, we made it so that you just added a post and it went to the top of the wall. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to make something where people could type in someone's name and get some information about a person. I thought that would be cool. Oh, yeah. Um, I'm interested in the feature of that you can SMS on someone's mm -hmm. name and get text information if you want it and send it back. Mm -hmm. I, I, I didn't know about this feature either, so I'm just wondering if there are any technical considerations for design considerations. So, I mean, the SMS gateways um, also have like an email counterpart. So it's like if your phone number is like X, then and, and you have singular as your provider, then like you could email X at singular.com or some variant of that and the text message would go to your phone. And um, that's a free gateway. So I mean you know how like when you text message people a lot of times like depending on what your cell phone plan is, it'll it'll cost you money. If you do it through email, it actually doesn't cost any money. So that's how we chose to do it. Um, we were doing a high volume of them, and we decided that it would just be like a better thing for us to do, to actually like kind of do it the legit way and send a text message directly to the cell phone as opposed to going through the email gateways. So we're kind of in the process of getting that set up now. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think that we're like always looking for more stuff to do. 
I don't think that we're competing with MySpace, but and I think it's kind of a different type of application. Yeah. So I mean, I did that so that people couldn't go through and scrape the pages. I and mean, we have a lot of stuff that we put in place to make sure that people don't aggregate information off of Facebook. And you obviously like you, you can't see profiles of people at other schools, but also if you try to view a lot of profiles, it like picks up that you're just viewing an abnormal number of profiles. And we also sort of like just by analyzing user activity, we've built like Bayesian filters that I guess just like let us pick out abnormal activity like really quickly and just kind of show very limited information to those users. But like one of the things that we wanted to do, we wanted to make sure we wanted to make it especially difficult for anyone to try to scrape email addresses because that's really annoying if people get spam. So we figured that by making it an image instead of plain text, that just added like an extra level of complexity in terms of scraping. Um, well, we can use it to target posters to you, for example. Um, I don't know if any of you guys bought posters off of that, but like we sort of like I mean, we're trying to figure out what we could do with that, but we're obviously like really sensitive to people's privacy. I mean, what's up? Yeah, I think we're actually going to be releasing something like in like late this week or next week that shows some aggregate statistics that we think are interesting. I don't know. I mean, it, the stuff is kind of cool, but it's not like the type of thing that you come back to every day. No CS questions? I'm especially disappointed that Will Chen didn't ask me any questions. <laughs> we'll work on Will later. <laughs> That's it? No more? Well, we've got a couple more minutes. Cool. Do you ever procrastinate on Facebook? <laughs> Every last season? What's up? Do you ever procrastinate on Facebook? Of course. I mean, I think that there's value to, like, to, the, to what people do on the site. But I mean, Mm-hmm. Yeah, of course. Um, I don't know if you're pretty much to the team, but like what kind of features can we expect in the future? Anything you guys working on? Um well I can tell you what we're gonna do in the next two weeks. Um so I mean there's the thing that I just kinda mentioned before where we're aggregating a bunch of stats and just kinda show like what's hot and like what's changing. Um, and also just like surprising statistics that we found. So like 2% of people at Harvard are libertarian, for example, or something like that. Um, I think that another thing that we're, that we're going to launch hopefully sometime either late this week or next week is something that allows people to clarify their relationships with other people. So I mean, a lot of the problems that that we kind of deal with at Facebook aren't always technical, but they're sometimes like they're social problems, you know? And it's like, one thing that I think is, is really interesting is, you know, if you have 100 or 150 friends, it's like, how well do you know each of those people? And who are maybe like the five people who you actually care about, you know, like a lot? And that's not something that you can really answer right now because the connections are binary. You know, it's either like you are connected or you're not. So I've been trying to think for a while about like, how we could design something that would make it so that people could express how close they were to people in sort of an unbiased way. So I mean, you can imagine like if you made a feature that was just like rate your friendship on a scale of one to ten, that would not work, right? Because like first of all, like no one would want to do that because that's like you're like insulting someone if you're like you're a three, you know. But um, <laughs> like it's also like kind of boring, you know, and so no one would want to do it because of that. 
And like it would just be skewed by social pressure in the same way that, that friends are, that like some people have a different have a different sense of what a friend is to them than like another person would. You know, so I mean, it's like if someone has 30 friends and another person has 150 friends, it's like, does that person actually have more friends in real life? Like maybe or maybe not, and maybe the person with 30 just has a higher threshold for making someone a friend on Facebook. So I mean, I guess like the solution that we kind of came up with for this was to make to like kind of judge relationships based on bi-directional factual statements. So for example, I took CS50 with this person, or I lived in a house with this person. Um, and like there's just kind of a bunch of different ways to do stuff like that. But I mean, I figured that that would probably be a little more accurate because like it's like no one's gonna like there's no pressure to lie about something like that. It's not like, what are you talking about? I didn't take CS50 with you. You know, um, but like if someone aggregates like a lot of different connections, then that kind of means something. So I mean, you take someone like Dustin, who is my roommate here, um, and it's like, okay, well, we lived together in Kirkland House, then we um, worked on Facebook, then we like moved out to Palo Alto, and now like we're still working on Facebook. Then like maybe that's that's like a that's like enough connections to say like, okay, well, this person like clearly has a lot to do with this person, you know. Um, whereas if um, if like the only category that you know someone through is like this person's my Facebook friend, then that also means something. Yeah. So I don't know. We'll see how it works. Nothing's for sure. What's up? Um, it's a combination. <laughs> so I mean, I think that like. Another thing that's pretty important for each of these events is the date at which they occur. So it's like, I mean, if you had, for example, like a date on each person's friendship with each person, then that would give you a more accurate representation of, of like what that meant, right? Because right now you don't know what friend means to like, to each of the people on the network, and because you don't know when that friendship was formed, you don't know like what has changed in their relationship since that friendship is formed. But I mean, even if the per like friendship means very little to someone, if you know that like that 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 happened yesterday that they became friends, then you still like know that there's some that there's some strength or it, it's like a certainty thing. You know, it's like there's like a lower certainty that their relationship has diverged since that point if the date at which the action occurred was sooner. So um, sorry, more recent. So I think that that's one of the things that we're kind of focusing on here is like I took a course, I took CS50 with someone this term is a lot different than saying like I'm a senior now and I took CS50 with this person when I was a freshman. And I mean a lot of these like the analysis of how like people look at this and see the relationships isn't necessarily like Facebook isn't going to rate the relationship. It's sort of people have an implicit understanding of what the difference is between having taken CS50 with someone this term and having taken CS50 with them three years ago. So I mean, I think that that'll kind of help out. Yeah. What's up? Um, not too. Because I think that a lot of the stuff, we sort of have a very unique platform for building it. Like, I don't think that there's any other company or like group of people in the world who could develop this right now, right? Um, I mean, even Google, with their like 5,000 engineers, is not in a place to like make an application that sort of characterizes people's relationships like this. And it's like the same thing with the photo tagging. It's like we could do that because. I mean, photo tagging only works if everyone around you is on the site, right? Because I mean, otherwise you're going to get a type of use where it's like you go and you upload a photo and you go to tag a bunch of people and they're not there and that sucks, right? So like, even if 50% of the people at Harvard were on Facebook, then the tagging and the way that we set it up would still suck. So like, it only works because 97% of the people at Harvard are on Facebook or whatever. So like, so because of that, um, it's like not that big of a concern. You know? Yeah. Is this sort of a software engineering sort of standardization sort of way? I mean, when somebody has like one of these ideas, like, let's ask every user's why they choose they can tell people, or I have a way to measure this, that, and the other about these people, or mm -hmm. mark up this thing on people's profiles. I mean, when it, how do they go about getting the sort of the go ahead from everyone else in the company to like spend some time technically working on that or 
to like get other people to work on your shit. Like mm -hmm. um, I think that a lot of people like. I mean, the people who work at Facebook really like working at Facebook, I think, for the most part, and spend a lot of their time doing that. And like, a lot of the time that they're spending, they spend like working on stuff that might be sort of like strategically important to like what we're trying to do at that point. But also, like a lot of people just mess around with the code base and like, kind of like put if statements in there. That's like, if the user is me, then like put this in there, you know. And like, and then I mean, so like I walk around to different people's places during the day, or like people come and talk to me. I, I hold CEO office hours as a joke, like from 2 to 4 every day. Not today. But, um, and like people just come and like show me different stuff that they're doing. And I mean, a lot of it is like relatively cool. And I mean, stuff that I like wouldn't have necessarily thought of. So I mean, I guess like you asked before if we were saving, if we were archiving old profile information. And one of the reasons why I said that we might start doing it is because one of the guys at the company came up with something where it's like, you, so you go to your friends page, and it shows your recently updated friends. And then you click on that, and it shows their new profile. But there's no indication of what changed. You know, so, um, so one of the guys made something that keeps an old version of his profile, and then makes it so that when you go to his profile, when he updates it, it highlights in yellow like the parts of it that were changed. And like, I think that that's pretty cool. You know, and it's not like a huge project. I mean, it actually kind of is if we have to start storing everyone's information. but like. But I mean, it's it's somewhat cool. You know, it's not like the type of thing that like that you necessarily are bound to come up with. But I definitely think it's like a pretty big improvement over what we have now. You know, it's just like now it's like really hard to like go to someone's profile and tell it changed. So and that's just the most recent example that I have. Um. So. I don't want to do that. And the reason is because I think that Facebook is a directory. And the primary purpose is to look up someone, right? Like type in their name and get some information about them. And like one of the things that's really useful is that everyone's page is structured in the same way. So if you want to see if someone's single, you don't have to like scan down the columns until you get to relationship status. You just know where that is. You know, and like so you like click go to like your eyes just like go to that thing. But like if you had like different people changing their CSSs in different ways, then like that could become annoying, especially if people are doing stuff like, like dark blue text on black backgrounds, and it just gets like kind of obnoxious. So yeah. Um, the purpose for me of the high school one was the same. I think that like. I think that the application, I mean, this is going to probably sound pretty stupid, but like wanting to look people up, I think, is like kind of a core human desire, <laughs> right? It's like, I mean, I think that like people just want to know stuff about other people. So I think that um, providing an interface where people can just type in someone's name and like get some information about them is just generally a pretty useful thing. So I mean, growth has been pretty good. It was tough to figure out exactly how to gauge it because we, like when we did college, we opened it up at Harvard. Then we opened it up at like a couple of colleges around Harvard. And the idea was always we we're really short on money and equipment. So while getting as little equipment as possible, we want to maximize our growth. So we want to launch at as at the schools that we think are going to grow the quickest based on the fact that the people at those schools are going to have the most number of friends at the schools that we're already at. Uh, we took a different approach for high school because we could just launch it everywhere at the same time. So we didn't really know how it was going to grow. I think it's growing at like more than 5,000 people a day, which is pretty good. Yeah. yeah. Um, when you started with Facebook, did you intend for it to become a full fledged business? No. Well, how did you Um. I mean, I remember like. Thinking that it would be cool if you could have a directory of everyone. I remember like arguing with my parents about this because after I almost got kicked out of school for like this project that I did before Facebook, um, like they were like, "What good could possibly come of like doing something new?" And I'm like, "Nah, this is pretty cool." I'm like, "Just like imagine like what would we, how cool it would be if like you could just like type in someone's name and get some information about them." And they were like, "I just I don't, I don't see it," you know. And I'm like, "Well, like." Like we'll just do it at Harvard for now, but like imagine like what happens if like one day you could just like type in anyone's name and get some information about them, and like, 
That'd be kind of cool, right? <laughs> so um, they didn't buy it, but now they do. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, so I don't know. I guess like at each phase, we're just kind of looking at like a natural way to preserve the integrity of the network, and also to make it so that it's more useful. I guess is like the answer to that question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I just suggest that you take the hardest courses that you can because you learn the most when you challenge yourself, right? So like 161 just like ruined my life and I learned so much from it. <laughs> um, 121 I also found pretty hard. Um, 124 kind of changed the way I thought about stuff. Like, what 124 taught me that I think was really useful was that there are like I mean, I think a lot of people focus on how to do stuff as well as possible, and like kind of like how to make like the most efficient algorithm. But like what has always gotten us by isn't doing it, isn't like doing stuff in the most efficient way, but laying the framework and like in a pretty efficient way. So I mean, it kind of teaches you both sides of the problem, like data structures and algorithms, and like how the setup is really important. And I mean, that's definitely like saved our ass in scaling a lot of times. Um, I don't know. Work with smart people. Learn from people. Yeah. So um, what are things that are Um people can make whatever they want, but that doesn't mean that they can put it on the site. So I mean, like, um, I think that like before stuff goes on the site, a lot of people see it, and like, I mean, I definitely like check off on it before it can go live. But I mean, I think that people have a lot of creativity to do cool stuff, and a lot of the times, like, it's like you, someone can come up with a cool idea, but like that doesn't mean it's the final way that it would happen, <laughs> you know? So like, so for example, people putting like highlighting in yellow, like what the changes are in their profile. I think that just the concept of, of highlighting stuff that has changed is really good, but the interface that that guy used for it isn't what I think is the best one, and the way that he's storing the old profile information isn't optimal either, and I mean, that kind of is cool because he was just doing it for himself, but like, but I mean, if we were ever gonna make something live out of that, which I mean, I want to, we'd do it in a different way. So and it's more just like a mock-up. So like the idea of something like the ground up and then like the top down design? I mean, it goes both ways, and like I'm not completely unopinionated. Um, so I mean, a lot of the solutions that we come up with stuff aren't technical or organizational, but just applying social <laughs> pressure in good ways. So I mean, MySpace has almost a third of their staff is monitoring the pictures that get uploaded for pornography. We hardly ever have any pornography uploaded. And like, I think that a lot of the reason is that people use their real names on Facebook, you know, and like, and your real email address, you know, for school. And like, if you have that, then you're not going to upload pornography, you know. And I think that like that's a really simple social solution to a possibly complex technical issue, you know. So um, 
I mean, that said, like we changed we changed some of the features around for high school. So, for example, we took parties out because we figured that like parents would get pissed off or like it would just like break up all the keg parties really quickly and that would suck for everyone. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Um, we de-emphasize contact information in high school. Yeah. Good morning. Good morning. Well, I am I am really happy today. So so this is the first time that I've used electronic homework in one of the classes and I was so happy when I looked this morning at 9 o'clock and found virtually everybody had engaged with the homework assignments. And so much of learning organic chemistry is actively working problems and actively trying to understand things that I was really, really excited to see people are coming along with me on this process of learning. And it makes me very, very happy. So today we're going to continue our discussion of chapter 20. And I'd like to introduce organometallic reagents and talk about their reactions with carbonyl compounds and their reactions in general. And then we're going to talk about reactions of members of the carboxylic acid family with hydride nucleophiles and with uh, organometallic reagents. And if there's time, we'll conclude by talking about use of these reagents and these reactions in synthesis. So when we were talking last time, we talked about hydride reagents with ketones and aldehydes. And we said sort of generically, if we have some ketone or aldehyde, now I'll write it generically, just showing our groups that could be alkyl, that could be aromatic, that could be hydrogen. So generically, a ketone or aldehyde. And we envision its reaction with some hydride nucleophile. Now remember, when I'm writing something like this, H minus in quotes, of course, there's no reagent that is itself a hydride nucleophile. But these are things like lithium aluminum hydride and sodium borohydride that serve as sources of hydride. And then if we carry out a workup with aqueous acid, H3O plus, or in some cases you can use water. And again, I'll put this in quotes because you can't go and buy a bottle of H3O plus. You could take sulfuric acid and pour it into water to make hydronium ion and bisulfate ion. You could take HCl in water and make H3O plus and chloride ion. And so you'd go to the stockroom and ask for one of those. When you do that, you get a reduction of the ketone or aldehyde and protonation like so to give an alcohol. Now, what I'd like to do at this point is to consider an analogous reaction, again, written at this point as an abstraction. So again, we'll take our ketone or our aldehyde. And we'll imagine instead of adding our hypothetical hydride anion, we're going to add something that I'll say is R minus with a lone pair of electrons, meaning a carbon-based anion. We'll talk more about it. Not necessarily something you can get as a free anion, and certainly, certainly not something that you could put in a bottle on its own. It would be part of an organometallic reagent. But again, right now we're getting our view from 30,000 feet. And again, if you imagine some type of aqueous workup with H3O plus, now, instead of adding in hydride to our carbonyl compound, we've added in an R group 
The use of primes and double primes and so forth is just my way of representing that there are various groups different or the same. Anyway, but the, again, in the view from 30,000 feet, the profound thing about this reaction as I've written it is that we formed a carbon-carbon bond. And so much of organic chemistry, both the practical aspects of synthesizing useful molecules and the real intellectual beauty of the discipline is the fact that we can create great degrees of complexity, valuable complexity, medicines, analogs of natural products, natural products that are too scarce to get otherwise, probes to probe reactions and probe biology. We can do all of this through chemical synthesis in which we take little molecules that might be able to be purchased and build them up into big and complex and useful molecules that can cure cancer or fight disease or teach us things. So now we come down to the issue of what is our R minus? What is our source of our carbon nucleophile? And the first really, really valuable carbon nucleophiles that were developed were Grignard reagents developed by Victor Grignard. He, he received the Nobel Prize in 1912 in chemistry for this. And the basic idea is that you take some halide, a bromide, a chloride, or an iodide. Fluoride is sort of the oddball among halogens. And if you go down your periodic table, to astatine, it's not um, stable, it's radioactive, so organic chemists would never, never work with it. You, you can't really isolate it. Anyway, if we take an alkyl halide such as butyl bromide and we treat it with magnesium metal, if you've done one of these reactions in the laboratory, you'll have seen your magnesium metal is kind of bright and shiny and lightweight. It comes as turnings that have been worked off a big block of magnesium with a lathe. And you'll put them with your alkyl halide in a solvent. The solvent will be an ether solvent, either ether or THF typically, although sometimes other ethers can be used. THF is tetrahydrofuran. It's a cyclic ether, so it's an ether with a five-membered ring and it has lone pairs. It's kind of like diethyl ether with its ears pinned back. And either of these work well. The, the result is that you get a Grignard reagent. I started with butyl bromide here and so I'll write the Grignard reagent from butyl bromide, we call this butyl magnesium bromide. And the ether solvent coordinates to the magnesium. The magnesium doesn't have a complete octet here. We have only four electrons around it, two from the alkyl group and two from the bromide. And so the ether solvent, the diethyl ether or tetrahydrofuran, will coordinate to the magnesium and help give it the feeling of having a complete octet. Anyway, as I said, the broader category of this is a Grignard reagent. And you can make these from anything from bromo or chlorobenzene to alkyl bromides to methyl iodide. And so this typically, typically one makes a Grignard reagent as part of a synthetic process. They're actually stable reagents. You can put them in a bottle, you can buy them. But in the laboratory, because they react with air and because they react with moisture, you would typically go ahead and immediately add a carbonyl compound. So let me show you a typical synthetic carbon-carbon bond forming sequence that one might do in the laboratory. 
So we might take our butyl bromide and treat it first with magnesium and ether. You'll often see people write a slash in an equation. Often that slash is a way of saying the solvent is below the slash or if we're just writing a simple line of equation, we might put our solvent be below the arrow. Then let's add a carbonyl compound and for the purposes of teaching, for the purposes of this example, I'll take acetone as our carbonyl compound. And finally, let's do an aqueous workup and I'll give us, I'll choose an acid here. Let's say aqueous HCl as the acid I would choose. And the product of this reaction now is a carbon-carbon bond forming adduct or an adduct with a new carbon-carbon bond. If you wanted to name the compound, we've now formed a six carbon chain. So it's 2-methyl, two 2-hexanol two as our product. So this is very powerful because now we've taken some small compounds that you can buy and we've made a more complex molecule that you might not be able to buy. Many molecules with this type of structure, these types of structures like alcohols with long chains on them are insect pheromones, for example. So some of these types of synthetic products are used to make traps for insects like Japanese beetles where that will, the pheromone will lure the insect to the trap and then they'll fall in and die. All right, so I want to talk a little bit about the properties of Grignard reagents and organometallic reagents in general. So metals, metals of course are much more electropositive than carbon. So any bond between a metal and carbon is either going to be a polar covalent bond or an ionic bond. If you want an index value or chemists like to keep electronegativity values in their head, it's a useful way of assessing the degree of polarity of a bond. Magnesium has an electronegativity of 1.3, carbon about 2.5 or 2.55. So you can think of the bond between magnesium and carbon as a polar covalent bond. In other words, you can think of this as having a delta minus a partial negative charge on carbon and a partial positive charge on oxygen, uh, on magnesium. Sometimes if you're writing a mechanism and you want to be quick about it, you could say, well, I'll write a non-bonded resonance structure. Even though I know it's primarily a covalent bond, I could write an ionic bond resonance structure so we could think of it as this. Maybe I'll put this in quotes here just to, to remind us this is sort of our, sort of our thinking. And so if I'm thinking about this from a mechanistic point of view, one way we could think about this, I'll take our acetone and our Grignard reagent written generically. One way we could think about this is that our organometallic reagent serves as a nucleophile and of course we draw a curved arrow mechanism. We help think about the flow of electrons and bond bonds by starting an arrow at the lone pair of, at the available electrons either as a lone pair or in a bond and then moving to the thing that wants electrophiles, in other words from the nucleophile to the electrophile. As we did in thinking about hydride mechanisms, we can't go ahead and now have five pairs of electrons around this carbon atom. So concurrently as the nucleophile moves in, 
electrons move up onto oxygen. And so we continue our grammar, if you will, of writing our curved arrow mechanism now, writing a product in which we have our negative charge. And if I want to be good, organic chemists are rarely good. We love to throw away things that aren't necessary in our thinking. But if I want to be good, I'll draw the magnesium counter ion there. We can also think of this just as we did with lithium aluminum hydride, maybe a little more correctly or certainly a little more sophisticatedly. We can think of our covalent bond and keep in the back of our mind that it's a polar covalent bond and write a curved arrow mechanism in which we simply go ahead and now take the electrons from that bond, move it in like so, and again come out to the self-same product. So these are good ways of thinking, sound ways of thinking about the mechanism of the reaction. So one thing to keep in mind about Grignard reagents and indeed about most organometallic reagents, particularly ones in which there's a large difference in electronegativity between the carbon and the metal, is that organometallic reagents like Grignard reagents in general act as very strong bases. We can think about basicity in terms of the pKa of the conjugate anion. So if you have butyl magnesium bromide, the conjugate anion corresponds to an alkane. In other words, where in the conjugate acid you have a CSP3 carbon bound to a hydrogen. The pKa for such a hydrogen is about 50. That's about at the very end of the basicity scale. That's about as, as basic as you can get for a carbanion. If you have an alkene, now you have a CSP2 carbon bound to a hydrogen. The electrons are held a little more tightly um, in this type of, type of structure. The pKa now is about 44. A way of thinking of this is since the electrons are a little more stabilized, held a little more tightly in an orbital that has more S character, right? SP2 has 33 percent S character, SP3 has 25 percent S character. As you hold electrons more tightly, the CH bond is more willing to give up H plus and give you a carbanion. So an alkene is a little bit more acidic than an alkane. These are all compounds I call very weak acids and I usually put quotes around the acid because you would not get any evidence of acidity from the compound, say dissolving it in water and testing it with a pH meter. And yet in a Lewis acid, Lewis base reaction, you can think of an alkene, say, as a proton donor under certain circumstances. Now by the time you get to an alkyne, now you've got 50 percent S character in your CH bond. And now these are reasonably acidic. They're still very weak acids. Your pKa is only 25. That's really, really, really weak still. It's not even like water, which you think about as an acid forming hydroxide anion. It's still a very weak acid or alcohol forming an acid, giving up a proton and forming an, <coughs> an alkoxide anion. And yet our pKa is about 25. And I'll show you an implication of that in just just a moment when we start to talk a little more about alkynes. But 
The point of this comes back to what I was saying before about carbon, uh, about Grignard reagents being very reactive toward water. A Grignard reagent acts as a base with water and so if you expose a Grignard reagent like butyl magnesium bromide to water, the water acts like a Lewis, acts like a Bronsted acid and you get butane and bromomagnesium hydroxide, a mixed, mixed salt here. So this is a, a Bronsted acid, Bronsted base reaction if you think about it. We have water acting as a, an acid on the left half side of the equation. We have our alkane as an acid on the right side of the equation and because the pKa difference is so humongous, the pKa of water is 15.7, the pKa of butane is about 50, I don't even bother to write an equilibrium arrow. The equilibrium constant is 10 to the 34th, right? It's 10 to the difference in pKa's. That reaction lies so far to the right that there's just no component to the left on it. And that's, <coughs> that's true with whether it's with water or an alcohol. And so just by comparison, imagine for a moment I wrote, let's, let me pick a particular alcohol. We'll pick ethanol as an alcohol. And so now we would get butane and a ethoxy magnesium bromide. And of course this would be the same with a carboxylic acid or just about anything that you would normally think about as even mildly acidic. All right, well, Grignard reagents are one of a broader family of, or, of organometallic reagents. Another fam member of the family that reacts very, very similarly are organolithium reagents. And so if we wrote Grignard reagents sort of generically as RMGX, that would be a generic way of writing a Grignard reagent. We can write organolithium reagents generically as RLI. Organolithium reagents are formed by reacting alkyl or aryl halides, again we're talking iodide, bromide, chloride with lithium metal. If I write a balanced equation say for bromobenzene and lithium, it takes two lithiums and that makes sense if you think about it, right? We're carrying out a two electron process here and lithium has one electron so green magnesium has two electrons and so a balanced equation becomes that we get phenyl lithium plus lithium bromide. And again organic chemists are awfully, awfully bad about writing products of reaction so I'll put the lithium bromide in, a, in parentheses because I might not write it. So typically if I were writing this as say a synthetic reaction and I imagine generating an organolithium compound and say reacting it with an organic compound, I'll give you an example of what I might write. So I might take bromobenzene or I might take chlorobenzene if I wanted, treat it with lithium metal. Now organolithium reagents can be generated in ethers and ether can serve to coordinate but they also form clusters and so they actually can be generated in other solvents including hydrocarbons. <coughs> I'm just going to skip the solvent here because it's much less important than in a Grignard reaction. And let's say as my partner since I gave you a ketone before, I'll take an aldehyde. The aldehyde I've chosen is pivaldehyde, that's the trivial name, or 2,2-dimethylpropanal would be the IUPAC name. 
And again, I'll imagine doing some type of aqueous workup. I'll just write H3O plus here to indicate I haven't specified the acid. It could be aqueous HCl, it could be aqueous sulfuric acid. One that I personally like to use in my own laboratory is aqueous ammonium chloride, which is a very mild acid and very good for workups of reactions like this. Anyway, after our workup, the product now has a new carbon-carbon bond like so. And of course, because we've generated a stereocenter in the molecule, we've generated it as a mixture of two enantiomers. We've generated two different enantiomers in equal amounts. We've generated the racemate. In part, in part because your textbook mentions various different organometallic reagents at this point, I want to follow along and in part because I want to remind you of what I think are really, really useful I items and part because I want to tie into this concept of pKa. I'd like to at this point talk about acetylide ions. And I see I have a question. Uh, yeah, you sort of erase, uh, erase the equation, but um, like um, for the second equation, what magnesium bromide is attacking the uh, like um, ethanol, why doesn't the magnesium bromide bond to the OH and, but instead bond to the ethanol? What's that? Oh, the question was why doesn't the magnesium bond to the OH? It doesn't, well, there's no OH. Oh, you're saying in that reaction, because the ethanol has now given up its proton to react with the but butyl part. So the proton has come off of the ethanol onto the carbon of the butane, leaving an ethoxide anion which combines with the MgBr plus component. And it did. So we had, in the case of ethanol, we had ETOMGBr. In the case of water, we had HOMGBr. So we had a very analogous reaction. Another question. In that second equation, are we supposed to have two lithium? Ah, great question. In that second equation, are we supposed to have two lithiums? This is very typical of how organic chemists will write a reaction. So typically you would see that one might not, particularly as you became more used to writing reactions, it might be implicit, but indeed you would have two lithiums. So you could easily envision writing lithium parenthesis two equivalents or, or two lithium. And again, this is very much part of the shorthand of writing organic reactions, particularly when focused on synthesis. Good questions. So will organic lithium reagents not be created if we don't have two lithium? Ah, great question. Would organolithium reagents not be created if you had only one lithium? Well, now imagine you would, what would happen would be you'd have one mole of butyl lithium, one mole of butyl bromide, one mole of lithium, you'd get half a mole of butyl lithium. Now, here's where the fun comes in. If I let that sit at, at a low temperature and used it quickly, I would have a reaction of one mole of butyl lithium, of one half mole of butyl lithium. But if I let it sit or tried to put it in a bottle and I now had that organolithium reagent sitting for a long time with more butyl bromide, I would get E2 elimination or because the reagent is strongly basic to give butene and butane 
or I would end up having SN2 displacement to give octane or both. Great question. So yes, I would definitely use two equivalents. All right, well, at this point I want to talk about acetylide anions and sort of follow along with our textbook, but also because thematically it fits in. So as I said, acetylene alkynes in general are especially acidic. While they're still very, very weak acids, pKa of about 25, they're strong enough acids that very, very strong bases can pull off their proton. So for example, if I treat an alkyne with soda mid, I get the sodium acetylide anion Now sodium's a little more electropositive than, carb than uh, lithium. Lithium has an electronegativity of 1, sodium of 0.9. By the point you get to organosodium reagents, they're pretty, pretty ionic in the bond. So I generally think of these as ionic. Sorry, is it NH2 or NH? Uh, NA, ah, great. NH2. NaNH2 is soda mid. And if I'm going to balance my equation, and as I said, organic chemists are usually very bad about this, ammonia, thank you, thanks very much, ammonia is the other byproduct of reaction. And now we see ourselves very much in the situation of a Bronsted acid, Bronsted base reaction. So we have pKa of about 25 and pKa of about 38. And so a difference of pKa means that equation lies way, way, way to the right, 10 to the 13th equilibrium constant or thereabouts. So basically I throw one mole of sodium amide, one mole of an alkyne, and I get essentially all acetylide anion. And I'll write, <coughs> I'll write a balanced equation or I'll write a synthetic equation here in which I say take propyne, I treat it with soda mid, NaNH2, which you can make by dissolving sodium metal in ammonia with a little bit of iron, and it reacts to give sodium amide. And for the heck of it, again, I'm just trying to give us a range of carbonyl compounds. For the heck of it, I'll take 2-butanone. And then since I mentioned that I like aqueous ammonium chloride as a source of acid for a workup, I'll just demonstrate what I would do in my own laboratory, which is to use aqueous ammonium chloride. And the product of this reaction is this. It is the alkyne with the alcohol. This is, of course, racemic. In other words, your textbook points out very nicely that you're going to add your nucleophile from both the front face and the back face of the carbonyl. And so we have one enantiomer in which the OH is pointing back and the alkyne is pointing out. We have another enantiomer in which it's added from the back face and now the OH is pointing out and the alkyne is pointing back. And we will get equal amounts of these, both of the R and of the S. Although this chapter is focusing primarily on carbonyl compounds, it's also beginning to introduce ideas of organic synthesis and carbon-carbon bond forming reactions. And so your chapter reminds you that you've already seen certain carbon electrophiles. So for example, you've already seen epoxides. So there are lots and lots of types of electrophiles you can generate your compounds with that you can, can react your acetylides and other carbon nucleophiles with. 
And I'll just point out one example here that brings out a couple of additional points. So butyl lithium is commercially available. It's a common source of a highly basic organometallic reagent that can be used not only as a nucleophile but also as a very strong base. And so butyl lithium is a great reagent for pulling off moderately acidic protons, for example, protons from alkynes and also protons from amines like diisopropylamine, which you'll see later. Anyway, butyl lithium would react with our alkyne. Remember, our pK of the alkyne is about 25. Our pKa of, butan of butane is about 50, and so it would react again in an acid-base reaction to give now an alkyno lithium reagent. And so we can use this as well as a way of making anions. And I'll just give you one example, or this as well as a way of making carbon-carbon bonds. So just to give you some diversity in your chemicals, in the molecules that you see, I'll take, say, phenylacetylene, and we could envision treating it with butyl lithium. You'll often see butyl lithium written as N buly. N means normal. Normal is just a fancy way of saying it's the regular, it's the one butyl lithium, rather than, say, the lithium being at the two position of butane, which is called sec butyl lithium, or being on a tertiary butyl group, which is called tert butyl lithium and is a stronger base. Anyway, let's envision using the common reagent N-butyl lithium, treating our phenylacetylene with it. That's going to give us our lithiated phenylacetylene, our, our organolithium compound. And just to demonstrate the point of other reactivity, we can picture the reaction, say, with an epoxide, and then again an aqueous workup, H3O plus. And the product of this reaction is an alcohol, just as we've been generating in all of the reactions I've shown thus far. But what's interesting about this is now the alcohol, instead of being connected directly to the carbon that had been, or directly to the carbon where the nucleophile attacked, it's, a, it's one over. You can think of this as R and the alkyne lithium. Rea reacting with the epoxide, and so we're going to draw electrons flowing from the carbon-lithium bond into the carbon-oxygen bond, pushing electrons onto oxygen and opening up our ring. So what we've done at this point is we've really overviewed a basic, a fundamental reaction of carbonyl groups, and we've introduced these compounds, these reagents that make for very, very strong nucleophiles, hydride nucleophiles like lithium aluminum hydride in particular, to a lesser extent, less reactive sodium borohydride and then various organometallic reagents like Grignard reagents and uh, organolithium reagents. At this point, I want to sort of broaden out our thinking and start to talk not just about ketones and, and aldehydes, but more broadly about the reactivity of the carboxylic acid family. And to just put this into context, I mean carboxylic acids C 
essentially all compounds in which we have carbon in the plus three oxidation state. I will get to the several questions in just a moment. Esters being another member of this family. Acid chlorides. So I'm going to paint with a very broad brush and later on we're going to get to a more specific understanding of the reactivity of this broad family. But right now I'm going to paint with a very broad brush. I'll include in the family acid anhydrides. And maybe, maybe to, to wrap up in main members of the family, I'll talk about amides. But before we discuss their reactions with organometallic reagents, I saw several questions. I think there was one here, one there. Yes. Ah, great question. The question was when the lithium attacks the epoxide, does it attack from the top or the bottom? Does it occur with inversion of stereochemistry? And indeed it does, although there is no stereochemistry at the center that we formed here. You could imagine, let's say, having two different substituents here like a hydrogen and a deuterium and we would get inversion of stereochemistry. <coughs> Typically epoxides are attacked by nucleophiles, by basic nucleophiles at the less sterically hindered carbon. So for example, if I had the, um, the epoxide with a methyl group called propylene oxide, this one is trivially called ethylene oxide, if I had the epoxide with a methyl group on one side, propyl lithium, the alkyne would attack the carbon that didn't have the methyl group on it. Does that make sense to you? Another question I saw one young lady, same question and? Uh, why do we like to use butyl stuff so much? Why do we like to use butyl stuff? Great question. So all all of our hydrocarbons ultimately come from petroleum. And so one of the ways in which butyl lithium is made is by first cracking, heating petroleum very hot to get smaller fragments. And one of the fragments that's easily isolated is butene. And the butene can then be taken on to various types of products including butyl bromide, for example. So, so this is one of the reasons that, that butyl is used. You can buy propyl lithium, but you can buy great big bottles of butyl lithium. Methyl is another common one. Does the chemistry rely, oh, I love that question. Yeah, all, almost all of organic chemistry ultimately goes back to petroleum. Some of the chemicals that we use as simpler building blocks come from other sources like carbohydrates and, and you know, modern, not ancient plant sources. But yeah, almost all of organic chemistry comes back to petroleum. So the seats that you're sitting in have a plastic that may be poly, I don't know, it's polypropylene or something and a covering that's a synthetic fabric like nylon. All of those have come from petroleum and so I look at petroleum as much as I hate to pay $4.30 at the pump, when you think about the amount of stuff you're getting, you're getting a gallon of gasoline. This is too valuable to be burning up because there are so many things that you can make from it. You can't get, you can't get a gallon of anything. You can't get eight pounds or seven pounds of anything for four bucks. I can't get a gallon of beer for four bucks. <laughs> 
and yet we go ahead and we burn it. So yes, petroleum is incredibly valuable to organic chemists. And one of my, my dear colleagues, Favorite questions, one that I won't be asking you on an exam because it's, it's too, too open-ended and far too ridiculously complex for you at this point in your sophistication, is to go ahead and write a synthesis of a steroid, let's say cholesterol or testosterone. You've seen in your current chapter some steroids, starting with petroleum. So that would be one of her favorite questions. All right, but I want to go now to, I want to go now to the reactions of, of esters and of various members of the carboxylic acid family. And I thought your textbook's presentation, particularly in the reduction section, may have been a little bit confusing because there are a lot of subtleties. And when I think about a subject, I like to think about it in terms of sort of the general rule and then exceptions to it. And there are a ton of little exceptions and your textbook has picked one and we're going to, they're talking about lithium aluminum hydride with amines and we'll, or with amides and we'll talk about that later. But right now I want to pa paint with a very broad brush a sort of general reaction of lithium aluminum hydride. There are these strong nucleophiles, these potent nucleophiles. Hydride sources, particularly lithium aluminum hydride, just reduces the crap out of everything. Alkyl lithium reagents like methyl lithium just add to everything as much as they can. Ditto for Grignard reagents with certain exceptions. So again, a very broad brush view from 30,000 feet, but we're going to take a specific reaction. We're going to take methyl benzoate here to exemplify our point. We're going to imagine treating it with lithium aluminum hydride. I'm deliberately writing this as a synthetic reaction. We'll talk about what's happening in a moment. And then an aqueous workup with, I'll just write generically H3O plus, and you might do this reaction, say, in THF. And I'll be a good person and write a balanced equation, or at least, actually, I won't write a balanced equation, but I will at least write my two organic products of the reaction. Your organic chemist is typically focused on the big stuff, but I'm going to write this product, benzyl alcohol, and the other organic product, methyl alcohol, methanol. And collectively then, these two constitute the organic products of reaction. And what this ends up illustrating is a new property that we haven't yet seen called an addition elimination reaction. And we're going to see that this addition elimination reaction goes through an intermediate of benzaldehyde. And to a certain extent, maybe with the exception of amides here, if I took any of the compounds that I'm erasing and treated them with lithium aluminum hydride, you would get a similar reaction of them. All right, so as I said, this is a big mouthful and I like to bake big mouthfuls into bite-sized pieces. So let's think in sort of broad mechanistic terms here. All right, I'm going to think about I'll write out our benzoate component. I'll write out our methyl benzoate. And I will at least for the moment try to be a good person and write a good mechanism in which I write lone pairs of electrons and try to keep track of my charges. And to keep things simple, I'm going to write, rather than writing out all of lithium aluminum hydride, I'm going to write hydride just as this abstraction of a hydride anion. And the first thing that hydride does is it's a good nucleophile, a potent nucleophile. We've talked about the reactivity in general of carbonyl groups. The carbonyl group is an electrophile. Electrons flow from the nucleophile to the electrophile 
and onto the oxygen. And I'll try to be a good person and write all of my lone pairs, all three lone pairs of electrons around the oxygen and then two on this other oxygen. Now this is not a stable species. This is not something that you can isolate. It's an intermediate. And so I'm going to remind us of the fact that it's an intermediate by drawing it in a bracket. We have a special name for this intermediate because we've gone from a trigonal carbon, a carbon with three things around it, to a tetrahedral carbon, a carbon with four things around it. I'm going to call it a tetrahedral intermediate. And as I said, the tetrahedral intermediate isn't stable, the tetrahedral intermediate can break down. Electrons flow back down from the oxygen. They push out methoxide and now we get a new carbonyl. At this point we've gotten benzaldehyde, the intermediate that I mentioned, and methoxide anion with its three lone pairs of electrons on it. The reaction doesn't stop at this point. Esters are less electrophilic than aldehydes. In other words, aldehydes are more electrophilic than esters. We can write resonance structures for esters or a resonance structure in which the methoxy group donates electrons into the carbonyl and makes it less electrophilic. Aldehydes, on the other hand, have less going for them. And so we have more nucleophile and you can't just stop at this point. It's going to further get reduced. And so here's our aldehyde. Here's our H minus again and again I'll try to be a good person and put it in quotes. And electrons flow from our hydride onto the oxygen now to give rise to an alkoxide anion. And at this point, that's what will sit around in your flask. I haven't drawn the counter ions or anything until you do a workup. And I'll just write this as workup, meaning adding some acid or adding some water. I'll put this again in our sort of 30,000 foot view of H plus. And the product of this reaction is benzyl alcohol. And the other product of the reaction is we'll also protonate our methoxide. So the other product of our reaction is methanol. And I'll just put that in parenthesis here. So I want to show you some generalities. I want to show you some analogy in this. And so at this point I'll write essentially the same reaction with just a slight difference on it. So before we could have been thinking about lithium aluminum hydride, I said let's consider lithium aluminum hydride. At this point let's consider methyl lithium. And so I'll take our same ester, I'll take methyl benzoate, but I'll treat it first with methyl lithium. And I'll write in parentheses two equivalents. I'll try to 
try to remind us that we're using a full amount of it. And then secondly, we'll treat this with some aqueous acid. And the product of this reaction now, instead of adding in two hydrides, instead of adding in two hydrogens, we've added in two methyls. It's essentially the exact same thing. And so now we've gotten an alcohol as our product in which we've added in two methyl groups. The reaction's going to go just like on the other one. We went via benzaldehyde. Here the reaction's going to go by way of the ketone called acetophenone. But just as in the case of the other one, we can't stop at the ketone with one equivalent of methyl lithium. The ketone is more reactive than the ester and so as it now is sitting around, it immediately reacts as well. And so that's our sort of view at 30,000 feet of the reaction of these very, very strong nucleophiles with members of the carboxylic acid family. As I said, there are some exceptions, some differences, but we can kind of catch this general spirit of this on the following equation. And so I'm going to write this. I don't always like the way your textbook presents things, particularly with a lot of abstractions because from my way of thinking, it's easier to start at the concrete and then work to the abstraction. For a computer, I think it's very good to like start with an abstraction and you know, it can spit out all the examples. But we've just looked at two examples. So now I'm going to write the abstraction and I'll say many members of the carboxylic acid family and I'm going to write again this sort of abstraction of NU minus dot dot. So some type of strongly basic nucleophile that encompasses all of the reagents that we've been talking about. So I'll say strongly basic nucleophile that includes, for example, lithium aluminum hydride, RLI, organolithium reagents, RMGX. In other words, all of these species have in common that they have a bond between a metal, relatively electropositive metal, and a highly electronegative species, hydride, or I'm, I'm sorry, a, uh, a uh, more electronegative species, hydride or lithium uh, or, or carbon. So basically the generalities of this type of reaction are that in general we get, and I'll write parenthesis excess here just to avoid confusion. When you have excess, in general you're going to observe addition of two equivalents of your nucleophile, which I guess I've written as NU. plus Z minus. So that would sort of be the biggest, biggest abstraction and I guess I'll try to be good and keep my electrons in check so I'll write a balanced lone pair.
All right. So what we've what we've looked at here what we've looked at here is an addition elimination reaction. And we've seen this general principle that when you have something like a methoxy group on a member of the carboxylic acid family, the reaction doesn't stop. Things go on. Now, to many students, the first time they see an addition elimination reaction, they find it confusing. And here's why they find it confusing. Here's our, let's say our ester. And we've just added a nucleophile to it, NU minus, to form our tetrahedral intermediate. And that tetrahedral intermediate isn't stable. It breaks down. It kicks out the OR group. In other words, our electrons flow like so to push out our OR group that serves as a leaving group. And the first time people see this, having already been through 51B and learned an SN2 displacement, was it 51B or 51A you learned SN2 displacement? A. 51A and seen an SN2 displacement reaction, people start to think about this and say, whoa, what's going on here? We don't see an OR group like a methoxy group leave in an SN2 displacement reaction. But this is a little bit different. Here a less basic leaving group is okay. See, in an SN2 displacement reaction, you've got to crowd five things around carbon. You don't have a stable intermediate. That leaving group was perfectly happy attached to the carbon and yet something's coming in and pushing it out. And it's going over this high energy barrier, this transition state to make that atom leave. And so that atom that leaves has to really, really want the electrons. In other words, a good leaving group in an SN2 displacement reaction has to go ahead and have a very stabilized anion or conversely, because stability of the anion means uh, acidity of the conjugate base, conversely a strongly acidic conjugate base. So in this case, it's a little different because there's nothing bad about the tetrahedral intermediate. We haven't had to crowd anyone in here. It's easy to get to this point. But now it can happily kick out the OR group and what it gets in return is a carbon-oxygen pi bond, which is very strong. And so there's no problem in getting your tetrahedral intermediate together. It's not pentavalent. There's nothing bad about it. But it's very good to go downhill and to break down and kick out the leaving group and get back your pi bond. So what I always like to think about here is in an SN2 displacement reaction, you've got to have a good leaving group. But in the case of this reaction, an addition elimination reaction, a less basic leaving group is okay. And by comparison, I'd say um, maybe less than 5 pKa is good for a leaving group in an SN2 displacement. Or maybe even an E2 elimination. So 
thoughts or questions at this point? Doesn't it work like a substitution? Indeed. This is a substitution reaction. So the very first step of our methyl lithium plus methyl benzoate reaction was to substitute the methoxy group for a methyl group and get acetophenone. And then, of course, we couldn't stop at acetophenone because it's even more reactive than methyl benzoate, so another equivalent of methyl lithium adds. But indeed, it is a substitution reaction. Unlike an SN2 substitution reaction, here you can have a leaving group that's a little bit less acidic, like an alcohol or an alkoxide. Ah, if you added a water and acid, I guess I'm not exactly following. You mean, oh, you mean, you mean in the second step, would we, yes, if we, so in the workup with acid, we would protonate, indeed. And one, one more question. Okay, what do you mean, great question. What do you mean by a leaving group has less than 5 pKa? In an SN2 displacement reaction, chloride, bromide, iodide are wonderful leaving groups, pKa of the conjugate acid respectively, about negative 6, whatever number you use, about negative 6 for HCl for the conjugate acid, about negative 8 or thereabouts for HBr, about negative 10 for HI. And you can go a little bit less good leaving group. I can write an equation, I can give you an example of a case where instead of having a very strong acid counter, you know, for the conjugate acid in an SN2 displacement, you could go slightly from negative, you know, negative 6 for chloride, into the positive range. I could give you an example as low as 5 for the pKa. Beyond that in an SN2 displacement, it pretty much isn't going to occur unless, like in the case of an epoxide, you have ring strain. pKa of the conjugate acid in an epoxide is 17 for an alcohol, but you've got that roughly 30 kilocalories per mole ring strain associated with the oxirane ring making it pop open. So that's the rare case in an SN2 displacement-like reaction where you can actually have what's essentially alkoxide as leaving group, but it's spring-loaded. However, in the case of an addition elimination reaction, absolutely no problem kicking out methoxy group or ethoxy group, pKa of the conjugate acid 17. Great question. All right, at this point I want to move on to the final Final point that I want to make in today's lecture and to bring us to some ideas of synthesis and showing you how powerful organometallic reagents are in carbon-carbon bond rea forming reactions, but also the process by which organic chemists think about using these reagents and using reagents in general to build up molecules. And so I'm going to give you a little bit of a contrived example here, but it's very much like the type of thinking that people use as they become more sophisticated. So the example I'm going to give us is to synthesize a particular compound. I've chosen it as, as an example to illustrate a point, but indeed something very much like it could say be a useful insect pheromone that you might want to make for a trap for say Japanese beetles. So we're going to try to develop a synthesis of 4-ethyl 4-octanol from compounds containing 4 carbon atoms or fewer.
There's nothing magical about four carbon atoms, but many, if you look at commercially available compounds, <coughs> in general, most of them are small and you can buy a whole range of different compounds. And more big and more complex compounds often are not as available. So you can buy many compounds containing four carbon atoms or three carbon atoms or two or one. Of course, you can buy plenty containing five, but for purposes of this example, we're going to say four or fewer. And what we're going to do with this is illustrate the way chemists think the process of retrosynthetic analysis And we can call this the process of thinking backwards about how to synthesize something. The reason retrosynthetic analysis is so powerful, the reason that the process of thinking backwards is so powerful, is it's so easy to get caught up in details when you try to look at things from a forward point of view that it's very hard to see how to get there from here, from compounds containing four carbons or fewer. Oh, well, we're using organometallic reagents. Do I use an organolithium? Do I use a Grignard? Do I, do I use a, uh, an ester? Do I use an acid chloride? Do I use um, butyl lithium as a base? Do I use methyl lithium? So retrosynthetic analysis is kind of like thinking your way through a chess game. We're going to start with big pictures and then work our way to the details. So let me show you how I would think about this particular example. And you'll encounter on this week's discussion problems several examples very similar to this that involve processes of thinking backward at various levels of sophistication. All right, so let me draw out my compound. So it is, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, Eight. So here's my target molecule. Now, when I first think about this, I could look at this and say, oh, well, okay, he said four carbons or fewer. And we just learned about addition of organometallic reagents to esters. So I could envision adding, taking some ester, it would have to be an, a methyl ester of propanoic acid because that's four carbons. I couldn't use any more. And I could envision forming this bond by adding in butyl lithium. And maybe again for the point of view of view from 5,000 feet or 30,000 feet, I'm just going to think in abstractions of some metal, whether it's a green yard or a lithium, doesn't, doesn't matter. And again, I could think, well, here we add in some metal. And that kind of catches the strategy. But we've got a problem here. And the problem is how do we get selectivity? I just said you can't really add one equivalent of a Grignard reagent or an organolithium compound to an ester. It won't stop at the ketone. Was that your question? Oh, yeah. No, that's fine. All right. So let me take this same idea and see if we can think backward a little bit. So we know, See, here I'm trying to do it all at once. And I kind of got myself going here. It's a lot better than saying we're going to think forward. But let me think a little bit backwards. We know that an alcohol can be formed by a ketone and an organometallic reagent. So we could imagine, so I'm going to use this arrow here. This arrow 
This big open arrow means a retrosynthetic arrow. It means a thinking backwards arrow. Organic chemists love arrows. Curved arrows, equilibrium arrows, resonance arrows. This is a retrosynthetic arrow. So I could envision going ahead and going backward to this ketone. And I could envision, let's see, did I do that right? Nope. I could envision this ketone, two hexanone, and a butyl metal reagent. And that would work. I could add butyl lithium or butyl magnesium bromide to two hexanone. And that would be okay to make that alcohol. But then I'd need a way to make this ketone. And oh, well okay, we can make that ketone. We've only learned reactions that form carbon-carbon bonds to make alcohols at this point in this course. So I could imagine making that ketone by oxidation of the corresponding alcohol of 3-hexanol. And again, right now I'm not going to worry which reagent to use, whether I use chromium trioxide, whether I use potassium chromate, whatever. But now I look and I say, oh wait, and I can think backwards again now to the point of a propyl metal reagent and propanol. And at the strategic level, we've now broken this molecule apart. We've used the process of thinking backwards to figure out how we can put this molecule together. And now, having completed our retrosynthetic analysis, now we're ready to go forward and worry from the strategy to the tactics of, okay, what reagent do we choose? How do we do our details? And so the last thing I'll do in solving this hypothetical problem is to show you the synthesis that I've worked out. So I would start with propanol. I've completed the requirement with each of my three components of four carbons or fewer. I've start with propanol. Propanol, it's commercially available. It fits the requirement. I'll add in, just for the fun of it, I'll use propyl magnesium chloride. I could use propyl lithium. I could use propyl magnesium bromide, propyl magnesium iodide. I'll carry out my workup with aqueous HCl. I could use aqueous sulfuric acid. I could use aqueous ammonium chloride. I could probably be lazy and write H3O plus over the arrow. But I'm going to go to the stock room and get some chemicals and I'm going to ask them for some HCl. The product of that reaction after workup is 3-hexanol. I now am ready to oxidize my 3-hexanol. You learn lots of reactions last quarter for oxidation. They taught you potassium dichromate in sulfuric acid and water, sometimes called Jones reagent. There are many, many reagents based on chromium-6. Sodium dichromate, chromium trioxide, there are lots of safer alternatives, including alternatives based on bleach, but we're going to use reactions that you know, so we're going to use potassium dichromate. Then at that point, we have our hexano our two hexanone and question. Absolutely. We could use chromium trioxide as an oxidizing agent. Lots to choose about from nice in our retrosynthetic analysis, not having to worry about getting that right yet. And now having the leisure of going and choosing our reagents and choosing our, taxi, our uh, tactics. Finally, to complete our synthesis, I'm going to take butyl lithium. And I'll do an aqueous workup. And again, I'll use HCl. I've written it below the arrow here, written it above the arrow there. Doesn't really matter. A chemist is going to read it the same way. And lo and behold, I have proposed a rational and selective synthesis of our target molecule for, for ethyl 4 octanol.
And this art of recognizing something in a molecule and seeing where it comes from is going to grow and grow in the course. Right now we've seen an alcohol and we said, oh, I know how to make an alcohol. I can make an alcohol by adding in two carbon nucleophiles. I can make alcohols by adding in carbon nucleophiles. Later on we're going to see all sorts of other families of carbonyl compounds. All right, I will see you on Thursday. We'll start off with a 10-minute quiz.